Hello you lovely lot and welcome back to another video or of course if it's your first time here, hi! My name is Katie and today I'm finally getting to play with these gouache paints which I've had for a little while now and personally these could be the most bougie set I have had so far they are the Holbein gouache 18 set and let me say I am quite impressed with the array of colours we have in here and speaking of colours, I just, I guess, treat them like a dot card. I'll just dot a bit of the paint onto the paper and smush it around with the brush. Two reasons. First of all, it's quicker. And secondly, I don't particularly want to pour paint unnecessarily into a palette that I'm possibly not going to use for the painting. So to do it this way, it just means there's less waste because these tubes of paint are tiny. So let me run through the colours that we have. We have Carmine, Flame Red, Brilliant Orange, Permanent Yellow Deep, Lemon Yellow, Leaf Green, Emerald Green, Permanent Green Deep, Ultramarine Deep, Turquoise Blue, Prussian Blue, Violet, Magenta, Burnt Umber, Burnt Sienna, Yellow Ochre, Ivory Black and Permanent White. And I think there's a really good balance of primaries and secondaries as well as, I guess, a few tertiary colours with the burnt umber and burnt siennas with those earthier tones there. So yeah, I think that's a good beginner set to begin with. Now I know it's not going to quite be the same as painting with them because I guess you do have to swirl them around with the brush and a little bit of water to your preferred dilution but for me these swatches I'm doing at the moment they are literally just a quick colour reference so I've got something to refer to for future projects. Now I'm going to quickly address something here I pronounce gouache as gouache I know it is also as gouache and also as gauche as I've heard before but really there is no right or wrong between those three pronunciations there. My accent as well as my art teacher at college is mainly responsible for how I pronounce it. A lot of other people I know in real life also pronounce it the same but you know it's totally fine however you pronounce it. Let's just put it down to a regional thing. My accent I know can stretch a few of those vowels out. <laughs> But anyway, now that's out of the way with, let's talk about what's going on with this gouache I'm working with. As you guys quite enjoy me painting dragons with this fabulous medium, I thought I would continue that and as well keep with a bit of a celestial theme here. So I'm basing this one, I guess, loosely on the sun. I wanted to get a deep blue for the background of space there. I mean, no, I know technically I could use black, but I thought a very deep blue would work better. I used a bit of the Prussian blue and added a tiny little bit of the turquoise in there just to make it a little more opaque. And I probably added a little bit of black in there too. One thing I've noticed, and this also applies to the Nicker poster colours, is that the blues tend not to be quite as opaque. And I wonder if that's just down to the pigments that they've used and how it interacts. I suppose if you did add something to make it more opaque, maybe that would detract away from its true colour. And I suppose maybe a couple of coats can rectify that, but it is quite an interesting trend I've noticed, especially while swatching things out. It'll be interesting to see and compare with the other gouaches I'm going to use in upcoming videos. And of course as well how it is affected by different brands and different price ranges too. For the background obviously yellow is the base colour I'm using there. I used the lemon yellow with a bit of white for the background and then I introduced a little bit more lemon yellow until I'd mixed for the background for the dragon's body and this is literally just laying out the foundations for all the layers I'm going to add over the top. The core of the circular sun part in the middle is the permanent yellow deep and I didn't add any white to that and I love how vibrant that was. For the majority of the colours, I did find the sweet spot of water to paint ratio was a bit of trial and error to begin with. And I guess we have to bear in mind that different brands use different pigment to binder ratios and I guess that's going to affect the overall dilution and application on how this goes down. So if you've got a particular brand of gouache you've been using for a while, 
and I don't know, they don't do it in open stock, so you pick a different brand. It's just worthwhile trying to find what that sweet spot is and guess not to be too disheartened if it's not the same as what you've been used to. You've just got to adapt. I used a combination of the flame red and the brilliant orange just to lay down the blocked areas for the wings. And I actually found it wasn't too difficult to create a very subtle but still definitely their gradient with those two colours and the paint in general just mixed nicely on the page. Although usually I do just tend to flat block out areas, I do like to try and do a little gradient now and then without having to rely on textures and patterns to do that. I didn't want to add any white to this paint so there is a slight compromise in the opacity there. You can ever so slightly just see the circle outline beneath the wing and unfortunately I don't really do much to rectify that with the paint. I didn't want to risk overworking it. But that is also something to bear in mind. I did erase that line but obviously there was only so much I could get off the page and yes unfortunately that does still show through ever so slightly. For the actual line work on the wings, I used the Carmine with a little tiny bit of the Prussian blue. And I was really happy with the contrast and depth of colour. I introduced a little bit of flame red into that mix just so we've got a nice steady outline there. And we are pretty much good to go for the next stages. Now I quite liked the purple border that I added, well the lilac border that I added on the previous dragon so I thought I might as well apply that again to this one and perhaps try and keep a bit of a running theme here. I used the violet with a little bit of the Prussian blue because I guess I'd already squeezed some of that out and just added a smidgen of white in there just so I definitely had a nice strong opaque line there. This was also a good opportunity to tidy up any of those bits of the sky which perhaps went over the lines a little bit. I also included it on the inner ring of the sun in the background there because I guess I was thinking in my head that having a double layered circle in the center the outer one could represent perhaps a corona. So I'm going to talk about how this paint felt to paint with. It's all very well and good throwing all the uh, I guess professional lingo at you guys or as professional as it gets but I sometimes think when you're using a medium especially if it's one you've grown to love it's nice to I guess discuss a bit more on a personal side how I'm enjoying that material. You'll note if you watched the last video when I was using those knicker poster colours that yeah light fast information just wasn't available there but as a painting experience and a finished overall piece experience I was really happy and I guess maybe as far as that's concerned I'd set the bar pretty high. However I really did enjoy painting with these Holbein paints. Once I'd figured out the nice working water to paint ratio things were just it was like it was painting themselves. The consistency was just right for adding fine details there. One or two of the colours could have been a little bit more opaque for larger areas, but to be honest, you do realise I do like to cover things up with a bit of detail here and there, as to detract the eye away. And as far as layering was concerned, I didn't need to worry too much about it. Nothing below had been bought back, which I always think is a great bonus, especially with these thick colours. Unless you're absolutely precise, the chances are you're going to have to go over some areas, even if it's just to tidy up more than once. And to be able to do that confidently without having to worry about the colour beneath bleeding back through again is golden. I loved the variety of colours which is what I touched on at the start of this video. I do think you've got a good set to work with. You've got some cool tones as well as some warmer tones so your mixing capabilities I guess are pretty unlimited there. I was quite impressed as well by how opaque that white was. You don't need much to introduce to another colour just to make it feel a little bit more solid. And using it on its own, again I had no I had no problems with it, it worked out really nicely. For the sun part I thought I would elaborate a little bit more on that corona and just use that neat lemon yellow there. Again I'm relying on texture to add that gradient but I actually quite like that, it kind of makes me think of sunspots although that would be more on the core of the sun but still I'm just taking elements here. 
I found that adding the dots wasn't a problem at all. It, I guess, applied nicely. It didn't glob at the end or anything. The consistency from when it was leaving the brush to the page remained pretty much the same throughout. And I took that technique to use for the dragon scales as well. And again, this is a great way of introducing tonal differences in there with the texture that's gonna be there anyway. I used a bit of the Brilliant Orange as well as possibly some lemon yellow mixed with the white just to create a guess a, another mid-tone there and just work in the form and the shape of this beautiful dragon that I'm painting here. Again, like with the last painting as well, I forgot to mention, but I'm using the Frisk Watercolour Paper Hot Press. It's just nice and smooth, it takes the paint really nicely, and I'll continue using that until it's all run out. If I'm not using Frisk though, another paper I like to use is the St Cuthbert's Mills Botanical. Again, it has a nice smooth surface, it's got a nice thickness to it, it's everything I like about a Hot Press Watercolour Paper. Now to add some more deeper shadows there, I introduced a little bit of the burnt sienna in there. I thought with the sun being as hot as it is, and if there's a dragon up there, it's going to be a little bit crispy in places, and I thought just introducing that burnt sienna in there would perhaps just give a slightly charred impression. And it really is a case of just building up those layers and adding in those tonal differences. I did add some highlights using the white, but to be honest, I don't really think it's actually shown up all that well. It's not so much that the paint isn't being opaque enough, because I've already discussed that. I actually think that lemon yellow and white combination might have just been a little bit too light for it to show up in the first place. But it is, ve it is there, it's very subtle, I know it's there, you know it's there, but it I don't really think it massively adds anything to it. But on the other hand, I guess really it didn't need to. And now we're coming up to one of my favourite and yet still more stressful parts of any painting where I'm doing this and that is adding the outlines. I'm using an extra fine rigger brush and I picked these up off Amazon but I can't for the life of me remember what brand they were. I think they're just an obscure brand but they're doing a job for me and I, I don't mind, they, they weren't expensive. And I do find that if you are a little bit intimidated by doing line work on your art pieces, for example, I really recommend just getting a rigger brush and trying to write with it. I think to try and write something with a brush at the best of times is difficult, but it will help you to develop some skills as to how to handle the brush, how to hold it properly, and how to create some really good line work. I tend to find sometimes it's more advantageous to use a rigger brush even for just small detail work rather than the line work because I feel like I've got a little bit more control and that is a preference to me but I do find it's a lot better than struggling with a tiny detailing brush. You don't have to keep dipping back into the paint as often and the flow of the paint remains relatively consistent. Another tip I can give I guess for any line work is use your palm or the bit where your palm and your wrist attach and use that to lever your paintbrush around into the circles you want to go. If you have a point where you have to stop the line that you're doing and refill up on paint, that's fine. But when you go back to continue that line, I'd start back on a little bit of where you've already painted and then you'll sort of flow it onwards rather than just trying to make it start where the last one finished. I think that makes sense. It's just time to add those lovely finishing touches, so I decided to hand dot the stars in. I thought a nice globe on the dragon's tail just to represent another sun would be nice. And I went with a red eye for this dragon because it just seemed right. Overall, I loved painting with these. The consistency was nice, the colours were vibrant and it was an enjoyable experience. But of course they're high-end ones, I mean, I'd kind of expect that. But don't worry, for the next video I will be going the complete opposite end of this scale of gouache and we'll be working with a very budget range. I do hope you've enjoyed this video and if you have, make sure you check out some of the ones on screen right now. As always though, I want to say thank you so much for watching and I do hope you've enjoyed and found this video useful. In the meantime, you lovely lot, I'll see you soon. Bye.